To get back on the track, we need an understanding of the real nature of freedom, economic and political, and the interrelationship between the two. We need really to have a greater understanding than these general comments I have so far given of the kind of system, the kind of principles that have enabled us to, to get this great achievement of the past 200 years. We need to understand how it is that a free market works to enable millions of people to cooperate peacefully together. I know no better way to bring this out than by a very simple example that I owe to an old friend of mine, Leonard Reed, who once wrote a little article called I the Pencil. This is the only prop I have for this TV show. As you can see, it's a plain yellow pencil. Said Leonard Reed in his article, you know, it's a funny thing, he said, there's nobody in the world who knows how to make a pencil. Now, that seems like a silly thing to say, isn't it? This is just the most obvious thing. It's only a piece of wood with a, something black in the middle and a little red tip at the end. What do you mean nobody knows how to make a pencil? Well, suppose you were to start to set out to make a pencil. First of all, you have to get some wood, don't you? Where do you get the wood? You have to go to the Pacific Northwest, probably, and cut down some trees. How do you cut down some trees? You have to have some saws to cut it with. Where do you get the saws? You have to have some steel. Where do you get the steel? You have to have a steel mill. In order to have the steel mill, you have to get the iron ore, and you can add all the rest. So in order to know how to make a pencil, you would have to know everything there is to know about how to start from iron ore and coal and get iron and convert it into saws and cut down trees. But that's only the beginning. This black stuff in the middle that we call lead isn't lead. It's graphite, I think. I'm not absolutely sure. And I am told it comes from some mines in South America. So in order to get that black stuff in between, you would have to take a trip down to South America and know all about how to extract graphite from the mines in South America. Now, this little red tip at the top, that's rubber. Where does it come from? Well, the major source of natural rubber is Malaya. That's quite another distance. And I don't know how many of you know that the rubber tree was not native to Malaysia. It was originally imported into Malaysia by private enterprises trying to make some money. And they transplanted it from somewhere in South America. I think it was Brazil, but I don't guarantee that. And they brought it over into Malaysia and established the, pla uh, the plantations there and got this rubber. So somehow or other, in order to make a pencil, you'd have to know about the rubber. Now, there's a little brass tip around here, and I've run out of my own technological knowledge. I don't have the slightest idea where that comes from, though there are probably people in the audience who could tell us. Nobody knows how to make a pencil. But the miracle of this pencil isn't that nobody knows how to make it. The miracle of the pencil is how did it get made? Who told that fellow over in Malaya to tap his tree and send a little bit of rubber over here to put at the end of this pencil so I could have a pencil in my hand? What's happened, what is it that has enabled this little elementary transaction to take place? I'm not sure what the price of this thing is nowadays. These things change so fast. <laughs> when I first started hearing about this story, it was a nickel pencil, but that won't do anymore. It's probably two for a quarter or 15 cents a piece. But what happens when I go down the store and I put down a quarter and get two of these pencils? I am trading with thousands of people all over the world, people in Washington State who are cutting down trees, people in South America, people over in Malaya, I'm making a deal with them. I'm saying to them indirectly, I'll give you two minutes of talk for two of these pencils. <laughs> in fact, I, I, I hope I've underpriced myself in that <laughs> calculation. Now, how is that brought about? Is there some commissar sitting in some central office who is sending out orders to these people in Malaya, to these people in South America, to the people in Washington? How is it that they are led to cooperate with one another? That's the miracle of the price system. Because note, these thousands of people who have been led to engage in this simple transaction with me, not one of them has been forced to do it. Nobody has had a gun to his head. 
They've all done it. Why? Because each one of them thinks he's better off in this transaction. And somehow or other, I've done it because I think I'm better off. Everybody has benefited. There's been no central direction. These people who have cooperated with one another don't speak the same language. They're people of all different religions. They may hate one another in every respect. But this hasn't prevented them somehow or other from being led to cooperate together. It hasn't prevented some kind of a wonderful machinery from bringing together these various components all together into this little pencil. What is that machinery? What is it that has induced people to do this? How has it been brought about? That machinery is the price system. That machinery is what the story is all about. That machinery is what enabled the United States to develop as it did. Because it's this price system which has the great virtue that it doesn't require any central direction. It doesn't require any commissars. It doesn't require people to be able to talk the same language. It doesn't require to be, be, people to be of the same religion. In fact, the beauty of the price system is that when you buy this pencil, you have no idea the religion of the people who went into it, whose work went into it. When you buy your daily bread, you don't know whether the wheat was grown by a black man or a white man, by a Chinaman or an Indian or uh, anybody else. And as a result, the price system enables you to have cooperation among millions of people peacefully, cooperating on one little phase of their life. Well, each one goes about his own business in respect of everything else. It works so well. It works so efficiently that ordinarily we're not aware of it. It's like the, uh, uh, your car. It never occurs to you what a complicated business it is until 3 o'clock in the morning on a dark road it stops functioning. And then you suddenly realize it's a complicated mechanism. And it's the same way with the price system. So long as it is working, so long as it's operating, so long as it's being, bringing people together, it doesn't even occur to you that it's this kind of a complicated mechanism. How is it that it achieves this bringing of people together? Fundamentally, at bottom, the essential, uh, the essential idea of the price mechanism is that both parties to a transaction can benefit, provided it is voluntary and not coerced. There's this terrible tendency, and most economic fallacies derive from that tendency, to think of everything as what the game theorists have come to call a zero-sum game, to think there's a fixed pie. And if I get more, you must get less. If somebody was able to make a fortune for himself, he must have done it by grinding under his heel the poor people, because the pie is fixed and he takes a bigger part. The great insight behind the free market, the great insight of Adam Smith's great book, The Wealth of Nations, was that it is not a zero-sum game, that it is possible for both people to afford to a transaction to benefit, and that this insight can be used to organize people's activities over a very wide area. It's very easy to see that principle operating if you think of, of two people under any circumstances, making a voluntary deal. I'll give me, I'll trade my pen knife for your roller skate. Clearly, that isn't a deal unless both people are better off. It's much harder to see how that same principle is involved in the far-flung transactions that went into making this pencil. And yet the same principles are there. The price system operates in this way because it doesn't require orders. It operates in this way because it can transmit information in a very efficient way without any person having to send an order. What happens if you or the rest of us want to get some more pencils? Well, the people who are manufacturing pencils suddenly discover that they're making some money, and they say, we better make some more pencils. Nobody has told them about that. They've just discovered it down at the corner drugstore. And they, in turn, say, send out some orders 
to people who are uh, making the, uh, producing the wood, to the people who are producing the rubber. The effect of this is to raise the prices a little all the way down the line for the particular items in demand. And that higher price becomes a signal to people all over the world that there's a greater demand, a greater desire for this particular object. Now, the beautiful thing about that signal is that the information is transmitted to those in a very efficient way because only the important item is transmitted. The people who are in the market for producing wood don't have to know why more wood is demanded. They don't have to know what, if, uh, whether the demand for pencils has gone up because there have been uh, 14,000 more government regulations that have to be fill <laughs> filled out in pencil, or whether maybe the demand for pencils has gone up because the post offices say, have said, if you address your letters in pencil, we'll only charge you 13 cents stamp. They don't have to know why there are more pencils or whether it's because there's a baby boom and more children are going to school and writing. All they have to know is that somebody is willing to pay a little bit more money for some more wood and some more graphite and some more rubber. That information is spread. And the only people who have to know about it are the people who are in a position to provide the additional wood or the additional graphite or the additional rubber. So the information is transmitted economically and efficiently. And it's transmitted to those who need it from those who need it. In the second place, the information combines with it an incentive to act on the basis of that information. It's no good sending out a message to people, we need more wood, but we're only going to pay you the same amount we did before. You're not going to get anything out of it. Well, so you need more wood, fine. That's the end of it. The beauty of the price system is that along with this information, and this is the second stage, goes an incentive to act on the basis of it. Because the man who is selling wood, if the price has gone up a little, well, he figures he can make a little more money in that way. And so he has an incentive to act on it. And that incentive is there because his income is ultimately going to be determined by the prices of the things he sells. The price system can operate to coordinate the activities of millions of people around the world because it combines three functions. The function of transmitting information, of providing an incentive for people to act on the basis of that information, and last but not least, a mode for distributing the product of that activity.